I've been involved in the AIDS epidemic from the very, very beginning. You know, uh, in uh, 1981, I was living in Chicago. I was a young gay man, uh, and my doctor discovered that I had swollen lymph nodes. Um, he had recently read an article about you know, gay men and swollen lymph nodes and this new disease. Uh, at the time, uh, we didn't know what was going to happen, uh, but that was my introduction. Shortly after that, uh, my partner and I moved to Los Angeles um, where we got introduced to some of the early organizations, the Carposi Sarcoma Foundation uh, from San Francisco. Uh, we participated in the first candlelight vigil uh, in Los Angeles uh, and the first trainings of the AIDS hot line for AIDS Project Los Angeles. Um, not long after that, um, you know, it became clear that this was going to be a major health issue at that time uh, among gay and bisexual men. Little did we know uh, that this disease would turn into be the health catastrophe of our generation. I think that everything about HIV, no matter how we look at it, begins on a personal level. You know? and, and for me, uh, while in the very, very beginning um, it was personal, my friends were getting sick, you know, uh, my you know, partner eventually died. Uh, I am of a generation of men who lost the vast majority of our friends and loved ones to this disease. Uh, eventually, you know, I came to understand that the only way to save my life and to save the lives of folks that I love is to get involved you know, aggressively in advocacy and in policy work and really changing the systems and the structures uh, to be responsive to this disease uh, and ultimately the to be more responsive to healthcare in general. My deciding moment, I guess, you no, know, turning from AIDS being a, a personal disease to being, you know, kind of a policy issue, really happened uh, in Los Angeles. You now, in 1986, you no, know, there was a ballot on the California initiative. On there's a, there was a ballot on the California. There was an initiative on the California ballot sponsored by Lyndon LaRouche to quarantine people living with HIV. Um, at that point, it became clear that this was not about individual folks taking, not just about individual folks taking care of, of, of each other. It really was a policy issue. Uh, and doing that effort, um, I got really involved in looking at HIV from the lens of race. You know, uh, talking to black folks about how HIV impacted us. Um, as early as 1986, you know, black people were disproportionately impacted by HIV. Uh, we were 25% of folks uh, impacted by HIV in 1986. Uh, and yet, you know, the response in black communities and the delivery of services at that time, primarily prevention and awareness services, to black communities were disproportionately low. Um, so at that point, I decided that it was imperative for me uh, to at least be one of the voices that raised the issue around HIV in a black context. Today in America, AIDS is a black disease. You know, people don't like it when I say that, and I understand that. I, and my point is not that it's only a black disease, but it is a black disease. And the only way that we're going to solve this problem in our country is by solving the problem in black America. Black America represents 10 to 12 percent of the U.S. population, and yet we're nearly 50 percent of the estimated 1.2 million Americans living with HIV. We're around 50 percent uh, of the annual new cases, and we're around 50 percent of the annual age related deaths. You know, no matter how you look at it, through the lens of gender or sexual orientation or age or social economic class or level of education or region of the country where you live, black people bear the brunt of the AIDS epidemic in America today. If we fail at ending the AIDS epidemic in black America, we fail at ending the AIDS epidemic in America. Over the, the last few years, we have done a much, much better job uh, in being responsive to the AIDS epidemic as it looks today. Now, uh, but unfortunately, we have a lot of catching up to do. Now, there have been, now we are now 30 years into the epidemic. Um, arguably, for the first 15 years of the epidemic, now there was not any effort to seriously confront AIDS uh, in black communities. Um, then there was a period of time where you know, we talked about the changing face of HIV and AIDS. Now, I'm curious about that because I've been living with HIV since the beginning. I don't think my face has changed other than getting older in the amount of that time. So I was always there. Um, over the, the last you know, 
five years, and particularly over the last two years, I think there's been a serious effort uh, to address HIV in black communities. And the good news is that we're starting to get a response from that effort. I think there are a number of ways that you can see the changes that are happening in black America all over this country. Five years ago, um, not a single national civil rights organization in this country had a national AIDS plan for their organization, an organizational plan. Today, you know, almost all the major you know, black civil rights organizations have a national plan. Um, they have national AIDS coordinators, you know, the NAACP, the Urban League, the National Action Network, the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, uh, the uh, National Newspaper Publishers Association, the uh, American Urban Radio Network, Southern, Southern Christian Leadership Conference. You know, all of these major organizations you now have people who are specifically and explicitly addressing HIV and AIDS in our community. Um, the president launched, you know, announced a national AIDS strategy last year. Now, um, previously, we did not have a national AIDS strategy. And in that national AIDS strategy, you know, we explicitly call out addressing the AIDS epidemic in black and Latino communities. In addition to that, we talk about addressing the HIV epidemic you know, among gay and bisexual men or men who have sex with men. That epidemic you know, is primarily driven by black men. So if we are able to truly implement you know, the, the national AIDS strategy, if we find the resources to implement that strategy, we'll do even a better job of, of addressing the AIDS epidemic in black com communities. In order to successfully fight the AIDS epidemic, it's kind of a, a three-legged stool. You know, uh, one leg of the stool is the government's response. Now, another leg of the stool is the community response. And the third level uh, leg of the stool uh, is the individual personal response. So there's an individual response, a community response, and a government slash societal response uh, to the epidemic. And you know, I think that in black communities, we're starting to see a bigger and a more ro robust response. And I think individually, black people are starting to embrace and to take ownership and to acknowledge our role in ending the AIDS epidemic in our community. Sadly, a part of that has to do with you know, the fact that today, you know, over 50% of us know someone who is living with HIV or AIDS, or someone who's died from the disease. And a large percentage of us, that person that we know that's living with the disease, or that person who's died from the disease, is a family member or a close family friend. You know, so it's touched black people at home. No, uh, and as a result of that, this is an extremely personal issue for us. Uh, it is certainly you know, a policy issue, it is a health issue, it's a civil rights issue, it's a justice issue, but it is a family issue. Uh, and our families cannot survive if we allow the AIDS epidemic to go unchecked in our communities. The Black AIDS Institute is the only national HIV AIDS think tank in the country that focuses exclusively on black people. Our mission is to end the AIDS epidemic in black communities by engaging and mobilizing traditional black leaders, institutions, and individuals in efforts to confront HIV, clergy, pol politicians, media organizations, celebrities, people on the block. Uh, we do four things. Uh, we disseminate information. Uh, we do training capacity building, uh, we do policy work, and we do mobilization and advocacy from a uniquely and unapologetically black point of view. And quite frankly, that's my favorite phrase in what we do. Uh, the bottom line is that we believe uh, that AIDS is our problem, uh, it is about our people, uh, and it is about our solutions. You know? And unless and until black communities decide that we are going to end the AIDS epidemic in our community. There's no way for us to be successful. Now, yes, there's a role for government to play. There's a role for corporations to play. There's a role for foundations to play. Now, but at the end of the day, now, if nobody else saves us, we have to be willing to do whatever it takes to save ourselves. Uh, and that's the mission of the Black AIDS Institute. That's our model, and that's the, 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 the methodology of our strategy. There are no examples that, that I know of where an outsider truly comes in to save a community, you know. And so the messenger matters, you know, um, the, and the folks, you know, solutions are better accepted by communities, better applied by communities if they come from the communities. 
Uh, certainly we can develop partnerships, but at the core of it, you know, successful initiatives are indigenous initiatives. They're organic initiatives. They, they come from the people that are targeting. And I think that that's an important lesson for us to learn as we develop strategies to end the AIDS epidemic, not, not just in black communities, but in all communities. The truth of the matter is that HIV and AIDS has no respect of person. Uh, and you know, while it is important to target communities, some of these targetings are artificial are artificially designed. And so, you know, the way that, that, that we work at the Black AIDS Institute is certainly, you know, we focus on black communities. We're clear about that. But not to the exclusion uh, of work in other communities. You no, know, we you know certainly understand the relationship between black and brown and red and yellow folk. Uh, we understand the role that poverty plays in, in HIV and, and, and poverty issues you know, can certainly transcend race and, 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 and ethnicity. Uh, and at, at the end of the day, you know, we all have to come together. We all have to develop ideas that bring us to the end of the, end, end of the epidemic because as long as HIV is raging in any community, all of our communities are vulnerable. I've partnered with you know, the Health and Human Services for a long time, um, in the early days at the CDC, uh, working with HRSA, uh, working with the Minority, the Office of Minority Health, working with NIH, working uh, at the level of the Secretary's Office um, itself. I currently sit on PACHA, the President's Advisory Council on HIV and AIDS. Um, and you know, it really is important to have these partnerships. You know, um, it's important you know, as citizens and as taxpayers that we hold our government accountable. But it's also important that we understand that we have to be active. You know, our democracy you now is an active one. We have to participate in our de democracy for it to survive. And in order for our government to de deliver services, those services have to be informed. Uh, and designed uh, and created by the citizenry. That is the beauty of the American democracy. And, and that's what's exciting about working with you know, the Department of, of HHS uh, and other aspects of the government. I also think that it's important to have these partnerships because we have to be held accountable. You don't get to sit on the outside and just throw stones. Now, it's our job not just to blame the government and hold the government accountable for what goes wrong, but it's our job to be an active player to make sure that more goes right. Uh, and at the end of the day, you know, I always say we get the government that we deserve. That's kind of the messiness of democracy. Uh, and if we want a better government, uh, if we want better services, it is our responsibility to make it happen. I think of a number of milestones, some of them good, some of them not so good. No, certainly, you know, in the very, very beginning, you know, communities coming together and saying, you know, um, we're not going to allow this to happen to us. We are not going to go quietly into the night you know, and building our own institutions you know, um, and caring for each other and building support groups and building hotlines and saying that uh, we are going to be there for our brothers. I think that that was important. Um, I think that uh, the development uh, with community pushing of the first treatments, you know, AZT. You know, I was among the first folks who were on AZT when we were taking it, I don't know, I think you know, five times a day or something like that. Uh, I remember the beepers, you know, so that we knew that there were the possibility of treatment. Uh, the development of the first HIV test uh, and the developing policies around HIV testing. Um, I think that some of the uh, milestones around heart uh, and the, 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 the three drug combination. Um, I think some of the missteps you know, that kind of have, have prevented us from being further ahead than we are today. You know, things like you know, the no promo homo. Uh, that you know, undermine our ability to do effective prevention. You know, the absence-only efforts you know, that you know, said that we were going to you know, 
you know, hold back information that young people needed to protect themselves. You know, we are in an all-out war, and we need every tool in the toolbox. You know, we should talk about absence, absolutely. Uh, but we should talk about, you know, condom usage, and we should talk about all the ways that people can protect themselves from HIV. And I think that, you know, the period of time when we were advocating absence only, uh, that was a period of time where we, we lost ground in preventing HIV and AIDS. Uh, I think that, you know, our slow response to needle exchange change, you know, cost lives. People died uh, because we did not respond fast enough uh, to the data and the evidence about the efficacy around needle exchange. Uh, I think that we are in a period of time where we have the tools to end the AIDS epidemic in America today and across the globe. And that's critically important and it's exciting. Now, with microbicides uh, and with pre-exposure prophylaxis and what we know about circumcision uh, and what we now know about treatment as prevention, our ability uh, to do mapping and community viral load. Now we've had an explosion uh, in prevention, biomedical prevention technology over the last two years. Now the challenge for us moving forward to make sure that some folks are not having this conversation on the 60th anniversary of the AIDS epidemic is to use those tools effectively, compassionately, and expeditiously. Wow, uh, what are my proudest moments uh, over the 30 years? <laughs> um, you know, I guess probably that uh, I'm still here, you know, um, that I'm trying as best I can uh, to keep my promise. I promised, you know, 20 plus years ago that I, I, I would be there to the end. You know, um, until it was over, we used to say. Uh, and so I'm proud that I've stuck in there. You know, others have, have, have moved on. So I'm proud of, of that. I'm proud of you know, the changes that have happened in black America around HIV and AIDS. I think that you know, when you look at the landscape today and you compare it to what it was 10 years ago or five years ago, it's very, very different. And I feel like I played a part in that. Now, uh, I'm proud of some of the changes that have happened in the way our government response has been developed around HIV, and, and, and I believe that I've played a small part uh, in that. Um, I don't know. I, I guess the thing that I'm, I'm most proud of is that um, upon occasion, you know, uh, I'll have a chance to talk to someone um, and as a result of that conversation or as a result of someone having read something that I've written or you know, watched me you know, uh, in the media in some way, uh, that they've decided you know, to do something differently, that they've decided to change their course. And that course um, has either gotten them involved in this fight or possibly um, helped them avoid getting infected. You know, um, and I guess um, that's as good as it gets. I'm a black gay man living with AIDS. You know, I'm a parent, I'm an uncle, I'm a son, I'm a nephew. Um, and this epidemic is impacting my community. This is what I should be doing. You know, no mess, no more, no less. This is what I should be doing. You know, when I was a little boy, um, my mother told me one day that um, we are a family. And the only way that a family survives is for each member of the family to do their part. And I kind of see defined families, particularly as a gay man, having both you know, a birth family that I love and care a lot about and a chosen family that I love and care about a lot about. I define family, I define family um, in broader terms. Uh, and at the end of the day, we are all a part of a human family. And the only way that our human family can survive is if each and every one of us do our part. Uh, and so the only way for a human family, the only way for our human family to survive is if each and every one of us does our part. And um, so I'm just trying to do my part. I think over the last decade, you now there has been less talk about HIV in the media. 
Uh, I think there's been less talk about it in communities. You know, the Kaiser Family Foundation does a survey, uh, I think it's every other year. Um, and in recent years, they've discovered that AIDS awareness and perceptions around HIV and AIDS have declined over the last few years. And so I do think that there are some folks who believe that the AIDS epidemic is over uh, or that it's happening somewhere else. It's happening over in Africa or maybe it's happening in Asia, you know, but it's not happening here. And I think that that's a problem because it is certainly happening here in a big way. Uh, and even in communities where we thought that we had made more progress than we've actually made, you now we're starting to see a resurgence. Uh, in the epidemic, particularly among men who have sex with men. And so that is a problem. And hopefully, you know, as we kind of look back over the last 30 years, we can re-engage, uh, that we can reinvigorate our efforts, uh, that we can recommit uh, to ending the AIDS epidemic. And, and that is one of the things that I hope um, will happen during this period of time. There are three challenges. One is the myth that it's over someone else's problem. Two is that it's a problem that cannot be solved. Or three, we won't have the courage you know, to make the investments, to utilize the resources, to utilize the tools that we currently have. You know, um, in a time when certainly we have economic challenges, you know, this is one of those occasions where um, we can't afford uh, to be uh, penny wise and pound foolish, as they say. I think that the challenges 10 years from now will depend 100% on what we do right now. That if we in fact act now, then we won't be talking about an AIDS epidemic now, now 10 years from now. Uh, I fundamentally believe while the virus won't be eradicated, the epidemic will be over in 10 years if we act now. If we don't, what I'm fearful of, in some communities, we're not going to get this opportunity again. Uh, and if we don't act now, we will have the same problems, probably greater problems, 10 years from now than we have now. When I talk to young people who certainly did not live through the trauma that we experienced in the early, early 80s, or people who are just now coming to the HIV AIDS battle, or people who don't believe this is their problem, you know, uh, I say a few things. You know, number one, that uh, we are connected, you know, and, and, and you cannot create artificial barriers that are going to protect you from HIV. So no matter who you are, no matter where you are, uh, this is your problem. Equally so, no matter who you are, no matter where you are, you start there. Uh, and I think that there are four things that each and every one of us can do you know, uh, to contribute to ending the AIDS epidemic and saving our own lives. Number one, to get informed. You know, knowledge is a powerful tool in the battle against HIV and AIDS. You know, what you don't know can kill you. Number two, uh, get tested. You know, knowing your HIV status is you know, a personal responsibility and knowing your partner's HIV status can save your life. And there's no reason not to know your HIV status uh, in 2011. Now, no, it has never been easier you know, to get tested for HIV. Now, the tests are often free. They are painless, no more needles. Uh, they're easy, you know, no more blood. You know, they are fast. You, know, you can get the results back in less than an hour. So they're free and painless and easy and fast. And you get information that might save your life. What's not to love about that? You know, so the second thing is to get tested. Know your HIV status. You know, get tested with your loved ones, their friends. Make sure your friends know your HIV status. You know, friends don't let friends go unknowing. Uh, number three, um, for those of us who are HIV positive, to seek treatment. You know, AIDS is no longer the automatic death sentence that it once was. You know, I know that. I'm, I'm a living example of what can happen when people with HIV have the love and support of family and friends and access to proper health care. Uh, and as communities, we need to encourage folks to seek treatment when they're HIV positive. You know? uh, and number four, uh, to get involved. You no, know, to fight the stigma, to get engaged, you no, know, to support AIDS organizations, you no, know, to 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 help, you no, know, raise awareness about AIDS in our communities, you know. So, you know, the four steps: get informed, get tested, get treated, get involved.
No. Each and of each and every one of us has a role to play in fighting this epidemic, and each and every one of us has to play that role. Now is the time. This is our deciding moment. You know, we have what we need to put it into this thing, and we have a moral, no, financial obligation, no, health obligation uh, to use those tools uh, and to make the investment now uh, in ending the AIDS epidemic. If we make that investment now, uh, it will A, save lives, uh, which is extremely important, of course, but it will also save us financially down the road because every infection now that we can prevent now is a treatment dollar that we don't have to spend down the road. It is someone who contributes to our economy down the road. Uh, it is a family that is left intact down the road. Uh, so uh, I'm extremely optimistic. You know, I, I used to say that I did not believe that I would live to see the end of the, this epidemic. Um, I don't say that it, anymore. Um, I believe that it is entirely possible uh, that um, I will see the end of the epidemic. Uh, but we are at one of those deciding moments. Uh, whether we end it now or not is totally up to us, uh, and no one else will be held to blame but us.